right, welcome back to PacWest Bigfoot. This is David, and sorry about um, any audio issues. Uh, my, <laughs> I have to tell you, I'm going to have to replace the old uh, uh, podcast mic that I've had for about four or five years now, so I'm kind of waiting for the new one to come in. Until then, I'll be using the old trusty headset here to record these awesome based on true Bigfoot stories from the beautiful Pacific Northwest for you. Real quick, want to say thank you guys so very much for listening in. And here's the deal. Um, I'm actually going to be uh, doing some more interviews here pretty soon. Um, and uh, we'll be recording those and putting those out here on the YouTube channel. Also, this month's giveaway will happen on the 10th of October. So this next week, and it's going to be a book called Tales of the Cryptids, Mysterious Creatures That May or May Not Exist. Uh, this is uh, investigated by Hall, Spears, and Young, a book by them, and so I hope you guys enjoy that. Um, <clears throat> anything else new? Not really. Nothing else new. Let's get a little sip of the old Sasquatch coffee. I do want to give a shout out to, uh, you guys can go to SquatchCoffee.com. Uh, give a shout out there to Gunner, you guys. Um, just awesome, awesome fella. And uh, he's actually a res researcher uh, of Bigfoot. Um, he does a lot of research with the Olympia Project. Um, I don't know if you guys knew that. Um, so there you go. The coffee doesn't just uh, give him a living. It also gives him the uh, ability and the capabilities of getting out there and doing a lot of research and investigation in the field. So <clears throat> there we go. All right. So <sighs> this week. Bigfoot stalks lady near Summit Lake, Oregon. I really enjoyed this one when it came in. I kind of remember a little bit about the beetle uh, and heard uh, quite a bit about it as I was uh, growing up for a while. Now it's pretty much a dead subject and nobody talks about it, but uh, it's because it's gone. <laughs> but I found it to be absolutely interesting because <clears throat> I remember something about it. So let's get that done. Let me uh, clear the old throat and <sighs> let's get this going. I am not sure you can camp there today, but I did up near Summit Lake once when I was in college and I was stalked by a Bigfoot while I was there. I know it sounds crazy. I mean seriously, I read the stories today and hear some online that sound very far-fetched. But I was, I was stalked and thought I was going to be taken by one of these Bigfoot things back in 1986. Here is what I saw and what exactly happened. College life was life for me. <clears throat> I was young and crazy back then, and being a college student at what was at the time SOSC, now SOU, in Ashland, Oregon, I was going to go into the forestry direction with, uh, with my life. I love the outdoors, even today, although I am much more aware and stick to populated areas when in the great outdoors. I still love fishing, camping, and even a bit of hiking <clears throat> with my own family. But back then, well, like any other 21-year-old in college, I was a little crazy and reckless even. What happened to me up at Summit Lake that one spring, however, well, it changed my mind not only on a, about my major in college, but my outlook on life as well, at least parts of it. But as I said, I wanted to get into forestry. I loved the outdoors, and when I could, I would venture out in them. Uh, I was a kind of hippie kid, you could say, except I took showers and loved my favorite perfume. Um, I guess you could say today that I was sort of, I guess, oh, well, a wannabe hippie who was going to get a great education and help transform how we do forestry one day. And that was my hopes and aspirations. <clears throat> that all changed, however, when I visited Summit Lake and I was literally harassed and stalked by a Bigfoot. Well, two or more, actually. There was a beetle back then that was deciding to eat up our forest here in Oregon at the time. It did not turn out to be that catastrophic in the end, at least not near what my professor claimed it was going to do. But, like a good college student, I listened and believed everything she said wholeheartedly, even to the point of being a little ignorant, I suppose. I decided to get a little extra credit done. That was, well... Not really extra credit in the college, <clears throat> but I wanted to learn what this beetle was really up to, and maybe even find a way to rid our forests of it. 
I decided on Summit Lake. Uh, back then, it had a small campground. It was a high mountain lake, and there had been reports of a pretty decent-sized population of beetles in the area at the time. <clears throat> so with a couple friends in tow, we were off that following Friday morning after the one class we had. Cold, wet, and scary. <clears throat> we looked at the weather forecast, and yes, it called for some rain, but we were not expecting a, del a deluge plus a storm. Upon reaching the lake, <clears throat> the rain did not cease until we set up our camp. Then, as if creation itself was on our side, it stopped for most of that first day. It was still wet everywhere, muddy in fact. So we used tarps beneath the tents to keep us dry and off the wet ground as much as possible. We did not mind braving the elements we were getting into forestry, so being tough was part of the education, we supposed. <clears throat> we spent most of the afternoon hiking around the lake. It is not a large lake by most standards, but it was big enough to be called a lake, and the terrain around us, the typical mountain and forest terrain. So much so, in fact, it took us a bit to get around it after taking a brief hike that same day. It did not take long, though, into the hike around the lake that my friend and classmate Trent found something quite unusual. <clears throat> footprints, or what seemed to be footprints. It was hard to tell, really. The ground being muddy and wet and all, it looked as though possibly that someone without shoes on slipped a bit in the mud here and there. Without a clear view and only some weak but deep impressions, we could not be sure it was human. It could have been bare, and that is what we decided it to be. However, Trent was sure it was human, or Bigfoot. I laughed at the thought, and so did our other friend and classmate Terry. She found it rather comical as well. <clears throat> we moved on as the name moved on. The clouds once again started moving in. By the time we reached our camp, the rain was a drizzle for the rest of the evening. It was not until nightfall and that lightning and rain and wind would wake us out of our sleep personally scared the crud out of me, if I remember correctly. The crash of thunder, lightning, and pounding rain, however, was not all I heard. <clears throat> I swear, off in the distance, I could hear screaming. I knew it was, actually. It was high-pitched and tapered off to some kind of wail, <clears throat> and even down into some sort of moan and long-winded one at that. It was very creepy and intimidating, to tell you the truth, even with two others sleeping within feet of me. <clears throat> None of us cared, uh, carried a gun at the time. We were young and full of the ideas that guns were bad. Today I know better, <clears throat> neither my husband or I, for that matter, ever venture out into the woods without one today. At that moment, though, as soon as, this, as the second of what I remember distinctly being four screams that night came, I was wishing I would have had something under my pillow that could possibly save my life. It was that scary sounding. The Hairy Man of Southern Oregon My two companions did not hear what I heard the night before as I told them about it over breakfast. Although I was sure about what I heard and rather scared, Still, because of the night before, Terry, changing the subject, started in on our mission, and soon my mind was on the beetle and the trees once again. That morning and day, we would be splitting up and gathering evidence. Terry would be taking pictures with the camera and taking notes. Trent would be gathering notes and some beetles, and so would I. I decided to take the west side of the lake, <clears throat> where it was a little more hilly, and there was plenty of old growth around. Terry went south, and Trent would cover some of the northeastern side of the lake. It was a very dreary day again in the Pacific Northwest. Well, that many would call dark and dreary. As a homegrown Oregonian, it was just another beautiful, wet, rainy day in the Pac West. We ate, chatted, talked safety, got our gear together, and said goodbye until 4 p.m. when we'd all meet back here. <clears throat> we, have, uh, we did have radios to keep in touch, but that was it for communication. And the only safety equipment was a first aid kit in each backpack and pepper spray. <clears throat> I'd come across a, 
uh, a part, I believe, of the Pacific Crest Trail. But looking at a map today, I think it was a different trail that just ran into the PCT on the other side of the lake. I mention this because I decided to walk on a rather well-worn and clear trail when the scare of my life began. I was also used to being somewhat not surprised by people out in the woods. I had spent so much time out there, <clears throat> and up to that point it was not uncommon to come across a hiker or two here and there out of nowhere. And as I turned on the trail, I thought I heard almost immediately a hiker on a uh, <clears throat> on an adjacent trail, not 30 or so yards, walking at about the same pace as me. Of course, this person had to be heavier than me, as I could hear the footfall here and there. That was a little more weird than usual, but <clears throat> else being, you know, but someone else being out there was not. We kept walking, and so did I. It was a few minutes before I started really uh, to really wonder if this was a person or maybe a bear. The steps I could hear became heavier as the trail they were on, I thought at the time, was heading closer to the one I was on, and possibly merging at some point up ahead. It was a darker day, colder, damp, and so seeing t uh, that far into the forest was nearly impossible. <clears throat> I was a little uh, bit nervous by this point, as the footsteps started becoming heavier sounding and coming closer. I decided to pull out my pepper spray at that point and check with the others via the radio. I could get hold of Terry, and she was fine. She also told me that it could be Trent that got turned around and is now nearest me. Either way, the word she gave uh, she gave put me at ease. <clears throat> Besides, a heavy footfall all of a sudden stopped. I decided to hang out where I was and find some beetles and record any damage I could see from the from them anything to get myself to settle down. I was off the trail about 20 yards, not too far, but I swear it felt like something or someone was watching me after a few minutes or so. At that moment I heard the footsteps again. This time they were on or near the trail I was on between me and the camp that was now about, about a mile back. My heart was skipping all of a sudden when the footsteps stopped and I heard what sounded like a deep but monstrous growl stalked in the forest. <clears throat> I stood still and pulled out the pepper spray. Again I heard footsteps approaching and I could actually see the shadow of something moving towards me through the trees. Not clearly enough, but I could see something. I yelled out for my friend, but no answer. But I could tell it was not a bear. Whatever it was, it just stood there past the edge of seeing any detail of it. But enough to tell it was not a bear, as it was standing on two legs. It was also extremely tall, maybe eight foot at least. I would see it a bit better soon enough, and would find I was staring at a Bigfoot. A large, larger than life, scary and wild Bigfoot. I got on the radio, but once again I could not hail Trent, <clears throat> and so I tried Terry. Nothing, just static. I was starting to really freak out at this point. I felt like I was in the middle of some B-movie horror flick made back in the yeah, back then in the 80s. This tall, scary figure kept moving, walking around me, circling me. It seemed to be staying the same distance away at that point, but it was still circling me, and I was starting to panic. I decided to gather my things and move back down the trail a bit to where I could get at least to uh, get least Terry get at least Terry on the radio if she was herself in a spot I could not reach her whatever it was kept circling me even as I moved quietly but with haste back down the trail I got about a quarter mile I believe and that is when I saw a small tree up ahead of me come crashing down in front of me across the trail I felt a sudden rush of fear as I started thinking this thing was trying to stop me from reaching the campsite it started moving faster, the steps sounding more rushed as I traversed over the tree in the middle of the trail, and I could hear this thing now grunting almost, as if they were, re if it was really trying to threaten me. It was also closer than it was before. I can now see its shape as it circled me, especially when it would cross the path or trail in front of me. I stopped once and watched as this tall, hairy monster took one step from one tree line and into another across the trail in one slide in one stride. It was as if it glided on air from one side to the other in a remarkable but creepy fashion. 
It was fast, too. It did, I did not catch anything but flowing hair, long arms, and a massive body floated quickly across the trail. The grunts, growls, and what also sounded like gurgling kept up, uh, kept up as it circled me and as I moved on. I did not run, but I felt like it. I found myself here and there letting off a squeeze or two of pepper spray in the air to ease my own mind. I was about a hundred yards away from the trail when I heard this thing growl and let go another tree across the trail, this time, however, behind me. I started to run at that point. I did not look back. <clears throat> Terry, Trent, and the monster of Summit Lake. I could not believe my eyes, but the second I entered the camp, there were Terry and Trent looking as beraggled and scared as I was. I practically practically collapsed next to Terry, who sat by the fire as I did. All three of us looked back towards where I had come from, and as a scream from the pit of Hades came bellowing from the forest not fifty or so yards away. I felt it. We felt it. The noise went through us. And I even watched as Trent started scrambling to take our tents and load everything up into the vehicle faster than a chipmunk could load nuts in a tiny hole in a tree. On the way home, we did not speak for nearly thirty minutes or so. After that, Terry and Trent told me of a monster they saw that was literally throwing rocks and large logs at them. There were several of these things around us, as we, we came to realize, and that sent Terry into almost hysteria for a few minutes. Eventually, by the time we reached the I-5, we got out of the car, ate, and just sat quietly for a few until Trent, Trent finally smiled and said he was glad we were all right. His words sat on Terry, and I, like a blessing from above, I swear. <clears throat> I decided on nursing after that. I still practice a profession in the Rogue Valley today for a prominent office. Today, I also stick closer to home with my family. Thank goodness my husband is extremely understanding and is not an outdoorsman. I am not too keen on camping as often or as much still today. We do not get out too often, and when we do, it's not far. And we always make sure there's lots of people around. Thanks. Rebecca <laughs>